Here's Margot Robbie in a bubble bath to explain. Basically, Louis Rainieri's mortgage bonds were amazingly profitable for the big banks. They made billions and billions on their 2% fee they got for selling each of these bonds. But then they started running out of mortgages to put in them. After all, there are only so many homes and so many people with good enough jobs to buy them, right? So the banks started filling these bonds with riskier and riskier mortgages. Thank you, Banjo. That way, they can keep that profit machine churning, right? By the way, these risky mortgages are called subprime. So whenever you hear subprime, think shit. Our friend Michael Burry found out that these mortgage bonds that were supposedly 65% AAA were actually just mostly full of shit. So now he's going to short the bonds, which means to better gains. Got it? Now, fuck off. All right, man. Welcome back to Political Ish. We are um, jumping on the zeitgeist here with this episode, and I have decided to uh, to look at the hottest issue um, in the nation right now, which which is the GameStop, Robin Hood, Redditors, um, Wall Street suits, um, imbroglio that's happening now. That you know, who knows, could have long lasting effects. And if it doesn't have, well, we'll discuss that. And even if it doesn't, you know, it's, it's changing the way we see a lot of things in our society right now, especially on the financial, in the financial sector. And, and to help us work through this, I have invited the smartest guy in the world, Mike Gatto, uh, California, California legislator, um, great attorney down in, where do you live now? You live on the beach, right? I live in the Los Angeles area. Yeah. The- <laughs> you don't want to say where, do you? Uh, but you might run for office folks, again. Folks watching and listening don't know that in Sacramento, calling someone the smartest guy in the room is a profound insult. So let me <laughs> wait to start this on the right foot. Thank is you so your, much. For that. Is that your whole bookshelf? Is that all you got? No, that's oh. not my whole bookshelf. I have the uh, the kids' books and the uh, the comic books right behind yeah. me. Yeah, sure you do. That's your section. That's that's. Yeah. The <laughs> Did I ever tell you that I had comic books? I was a huge comic book collector when I was a kid, mm-hmm. and um. I had comic books from the 60s, early 70s. Go ahead and say, oh, you bought them in your 30s? Yeah, you bought them in your 30s or your 40s? Yeah. Yeah. Came to late in life. Uh, My ex-wife threw them all away. Wow. Tossed them away. These were in pristine condition in plastic covers. And um, from the 60s, I had like like Hulk editions, you know, single digit editions. And uh, in a dumpster somewhere in Carmichael. So um, those had to be quite valuable. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this was in the, you know, the late nineties when this was done. So um, anyway, when you mention comic books, I always get a little, <clears throat> a little <laughs> twinge. <laughs> do you cl- do you honestly collect comic books? Because you seem like that kind of guy that would. Oh, no, I I don't collect comic books. <laughs> I uh, the closest thing I have is a set of presidential comic books from when I was. A oh kid. my god! You see, actually, you seem more like that guy. That's yeah. That's even nerdier. <laughs> That's, that's yeah. like, above the, I was way too nerdy for the Superman comics. They had to you be. Got, you got like the Millard Fillmore, right? Yes, Millard Fillmore, Andrew Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so let's talk about GameStop. Let's talk about Robin Hood. Let's talk about um, Reddit. Let's talk about Mark Cuban. Let's talk about Elon Musk. I mean, so so in a, in a nutshell here what happened who who is uh, who are who is this reddit wall street bets what are they and by by the way i'm a big fan of reddit but apparently i'm not going in the right areas cuz i've never gone to wall street bets but so who's reddit wall street bets cuz it seems like they're getting a lot of the blame for this whole thing for starting it yeah so wall street bets is a uh, reddit board that uh, figures uh, very prominently in this they feature every day these sort of random posts where people post their uh, stock tips plus their stock gains and their stock losses. There is a um, a theme on Wall Street bets that when you have a truly like bankruptcy inducing loss that you brag about it. So you'll have these guys who will post a screenshot of their E Trade account for the day where they have like a two hundred fifty thousand dollar loss, and uh, it's got a weird ethos. There's a lot of uh, you know, very unpolitically correct uh, discussions there and uh, choice of words. It's very meme heavy. There's a, there's a certain meme from the world of Dungeons and Dragons and all sorts of stuff. 
And it's given a lot of credit for better or for worse as to launching this big uh, move to raise the price of GameStop shares. Yeah, you know, I actually took a peek over there for a bit and saw some of the videos, you know, because now, you know, people who are involved have a lot of stuff up on YouTube. And it's a whole different world, man. It is a whole different world. It's, it's very gamer bro heavy. Gamer sure. bro. And, and you know what? I'm actually fearful of saying that because those are the kind of people that would hear me say that and completely ruin my life Right, they would not. If anyone knows how to hack or dox, those guys know to how to hack and dox. And um, I think when, when I when I put a tweet out there that is critical of Elon Musk, I think the same thing. I mean, that guy is a vindictive dude. Yeah, but anyway, but for the average person watching, though, for the average person watching, I can tell you, you know, feel free to, to confirm this on me. Wall Street bets is largely impenetrable, right? It's not like you can go there and be like, oh, what's the consensus stock tip? You know, what do people think about IBM? What's the disc? No, you'll have these, these, you know, these posts with like a million comments where one guy will be calling another guy the F word and another guy, you know, and so to give it this credit for the rise of GameStop, probably not the entire story, but that, that brings us to one of the first points of our discussion today, which is if you want to find out the true sentiment from something like Wall Street Bets, where there might be a million posts a day, you're going to be using big technology to crawl it. You're not going to be casually perusing it and saying, hey, what does, uh, what does Gamer360 My Basement say about uh, whether or not I should buy Uber shares? No, it's not like that. Uh, there are big hedge funds that are crawling Wall Street Bets to see which symbols are posted most often. So this idea that it's totally hedge fund free, that's okay. one of the things we must smell. Could we, uh, for the sake of uh, sounding like a dude from Office Space, can we put a pin in that? Because I do, I do want to revisit that um, in a minute, uh, because I do want to talk about that, because that's a big, a big point of this conversation, what you just mentioned. So the Reddit, the, the Reddit guys, or that, the, the folks of that ilk, um, I did not mean that in a pejorative sense, Reddit guys, please do not dox me. Um, the folks of that uh, kind, uh, where do they do their trading? They go to folks like Webull, right, or Robinhood to do their trading because that was created for the everyman trader, right? And you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So those, uh, those types of apps? Yeah, I mean, look, you want to go way back uh, when you and I were coming up, and this is a comment about both of our ages. Um, uh, there really weren't any retail brokerages. If you wanted to trade a stock, you might face, you might have to actually make a call. Uh, then with the advent of the internet, you know, it was $30 a trade, $50 a trade, $100 a, share, a trade. So if you were making a small trade, you know, buying a hundred shares of a penny stock, the, the commission would take your entire nest egg, right? You, you, you wouldn't make, be able to make those trades. Uh, then came the advent of the retail brokerages, the E-trades, the Ameritrades, and they reduced trading to nine bucks a share, or nine bucks a trade, six bucks a trade, so on and so forth. But then Robinhood came to mix, and Robinhood was marketed towards millennials. It was mostly a phone app as opposed to a, uh, a you know, a desktop site. It had cool bells and whistles, literally. It had sort of casino-like bells and whistles when you traded. And uh, they said, we are going to make all trades for free. And uh, then the other uh, brokerages followed suit, E-Trade and Ameritrade. And this is a time to talk about the old Silicon Valley saw. Right. If you don't know what a, how a website is making money, they're making money off you. Uh, if you don't know what the product is, the product is you. Uh, that's one of the things that emerged in this, and this is another digression, uh, but it emerged that Robin, well, you know, people started to become aware of the fact that Robinhood and a lot of these brokerages are selling your trade flow to some of the big pools and some of the big uh, exchanges, uh, which allegedly might allow some of the hedge funds to front run it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and certainly provides liquidity and uh, volatility. And in this business, right, in this world, and I know we're saying pretty elementary stuff to a lot of people, but in this world, even a couple of seconds gives you the ability to make millions over the person next to you, right? Correct. So I have a friend who's a billionaire, kind of low-key. You don't find his name in too many newspapers. Uh, lives Thank in you. A, uh, yeah, well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> li lives in a gigantic house in the hills. <laughs> but this, guy made, this guy has a quant right and uh, the basic theme of his quantitative fund which is so so and i should i should go back a little bit the classic hedge fund model right is the guy who has good hunches and he's got good intel and good research and with a mix of stuff that is semi-insider trading right, and, right. he slams the phone down right and runs to his laptop his desktop right and says yeah. I've analyzed, you know, the stock of uh, Pacific Bell, and it's a great company, and it's going to rocket up next week. 
right? Because I have photos of the Walmart parking lots, right? Stuff like that. <laughs> but what people don't realize is most hedge funds nowadays are not like that. They are quantitative funds, meaning that they are run by computers using fancy and very complicated algorithms. And my friend's fund, what it does is it looks for tiny price discrepancies. Uh, people think about there's only a few stock exchanges, but the reality is there are a lot of different exchanges that power the NASDAQ and power the New York Stock Exchanges. These are clearing houses and places where trades are executed. And one of them might have a share of GameStop at $6.32, and the other one might have it at $6.31.5. And, and if you can quickly have a computer buy the one that's at $6.31.5 and, and then sell it on the other one at the same time for $6.32, you will make millions or billions over the course of a year. These are similar to the folks that do this with um, currency exchanges, right? Precisely. They, and, they very, go ahead, go ahead, Mike. Well, and, and to let people know how competitive this world is, because I, I want people to really understand that this is not about skill. It is not about uh, having connections or analyzing stocks. It's about computing power. Uh, some of these firms are famous for one of them thought that the, the wires were not fast enough by the way, electricity on the wires travels almost the speed of light. It was not fast enough to execute their trades on these complex arbitrages. So they bought the real estate that was right across the street from the key options exchange. And then another guy said, well, oh, that guy did that. So he bought a microwave beam to beam to the thing so that he didn't have to use the wires oh my God. Right? to get a trillionth of a second advantage when these trades are executed. Because that trillionth of a second can mean hundreds of millions of dollars if you're right in the right space, exactly. right? Precisely just amazing. And so, um, so that's what hedge funds are now, right? Most of them or a lot. Yeah. Of them. yeah. It, it's not the guy in suspenders who's talking on the phone. Cause he's got a hunch with a guy on the inside. Right. I mean, honestly, that's caveman compared to what these guys do now. Um, those guys still exist and they're very proud of their work. And, and frankly, I actually think that that's more of an art form. And there are ones out there that will, you know, they will, um, scan for, for, for the cars in the mining towns in Africa to determine if the mine workers are doing well and hence the mine is doing well and hence you should buy the stock. And I respect that. That is really fancy research. But most hedge funds, many hedge funds, they're just computer driven. None of this fancy stuff. So, so you know, this, <laughs> this kind of brings up a good question because we call it the market, right? Is that a market? Is that a market when you know, stocks are bought and sold within a literal fraction of a second. And that fraction of a second can um, make the difference between, you know, hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. Is that a market? Is that a fair market? Who else can compete with that? I mean, unless you have one of those state of the art that probably only a hedge fund can afford um, systems, who, who else can can participate in it. We're probably getting ahead of ourselves, but who can participate in that market? You know, that's a very good question. And, um, and it, it calls into uh, you know, a debate that I've heard some of, some of my friends and some other people out there uh, discuss at times. So first of all, it's important to note that the people who will say that this is a market will say that they are creating the most efficient market possible. They are noting differences between various uh, prices and they're taking advantage of it. But what they're also doing is they're making sure that when a retail trader, when me or you want to buy something at a market price, that we are getting the best possible available market price. Because, you know, as many traders know, there is a difference between the bid and the ask. And if you can get those down because of a lot of volume, then the person who puts in place a market order is going to get it executed at the best possible price. So that's the argument for that these guys are helping. The argument that the quantitative funds are hurting is a little bit more profound and I think maybe a little more complex. So first of all, there are allegations that they are front running, that they get to see the book of trades, that uh, when you or I are out there saying buy 100 shares IBM, that those are put into a clearinghouse and that the computers can see those in advance. And there's some truth to that. Uh, not so that they can you know, necessarily sell us a stock. I mean, if you put in a limit order, it's not gonna execute magically uh, at, a, at a worse price than what you want, but they can see the order flow. They can kind of get a sense of where the market is headed. And that's one important advantage. And the second one is, it's just impossible to make money this way for the average person. You need to have a tremendous amount of resources to invest. Yeah. So it's really the old saw that those who have money can make money. 
Correct. And one little wrinkle on this, uh, my friend who's in this business, um, you know, he has had a lot of bad years in the last couple of recent years. And that's because there's always an arms race. Uh, as soon as you find a pattern that your computer notices that might take advantage of stuff, you know, like uh, sales of shirt manufacturers go up on Friday, right? You notice this trend. As soon as you take advantage of it within, you know, three months or even three days, your research is outdated. And there's another computer that has noticed your trend and is taking advantage to sell the shares to your computer. So, I mean, it, it really is an arms race and it's a little more nuanced than either side makes it out to be. So you mentioned a, you mentioned the term order flow. So order flow br brings us back to Robinhood. And if you, if you uh, are wondering what the product is, you are. So apparently Robinhood is, you know, it, it's every man seller. It's, you know, the democratization of stock trading. Um, and so everybody, you know, flocked to it. It's been very, very successful. And like you said, um, from everything I have read or listened to, they have a very, very friendly user interface. And I think you, you kind of talked about that too. So, but here is where they make their money. They make their money on the order flow, right? So they allow their investors or people that they have agreements with to see that order flow. So when the gamers, when gamer guy, right, uh, is down there and he's putting in all his trades, are you, does that mean that they are then selling the ability to see that order flow to Citadel or Melvin or some other uh, hedge fund? You want to explain that a little bit? Yeah, so there's two parts of that. So the first part, what I think the hedge funds would argue and have argued publicly is we're not necessarily front running or seeing anything in advance. We are just taking advantage of the order flow because our computers, which are making trillions of trades a, a day or you know billions a minute or whatever it is, they need to have liquidity. They need to have other orders so that there's always a counterparty. But there have been allegations and uh, certainly you know 10 years ago, if you wanna go way back, uh, there were allegations that the mutual fund industry was indeed selling stuff so that it was front run. For example, if there was a mutual fund that bought nothing but gold shares. And so the more people are putting in that fund, obviously the more gold shares it's buying and it's driving up that price of those stocks. Um, mutual funds settle at the end of the day. So getting that information of like, you know, the public bought a hundred billion dollars of a mutual fund that focuses on uh, electric car manufacturers. So that's going to drive up the price of Tesla and Neo and all the other electric car manufacturers. That has value. That information has value. We live in an information economy. And so, yes, you know, that ability for the computers to see, you know, the order flow, you know, in a, in a matter of, you know, hundreds of hundreds of a second or, you know, before the orders are public does have a value. And that is one of the allegations that we'll see if it's true or not. Okay. Now, what is this brings us this brings us to the I think one of the final things that, you know, I think the public really needs to understand better. And that is a short. What is a short and what is a short squeeze? I, I think I've heard a million different examples of what a short is, um, but I come to the smartest guy in the world. And so what what is a short and what is a short squeeze, which is what the Redditors did to the suits on Wall Street? So a short is very simple. You are buying, a, I'm sorry, you are borrowing a product, you are then selling it, and then you are repaying the cost that you borrowed it for. So people say, oh my God, how artificial. Well, let me give an example in the real world. The car dealer that you go to. So if you go to a car dealer to buy a Chevy, he doesn't own all those cars. That would be extremely expensive. He actually borrows them from the manufacturer, from Chevy, or in some cases from a middleman and gets financing to do it. There are banks that do nothing but lend to car dealers so that they can go and borrow the cars and uh, offer them to the public and then sell them, which they don't own, and then repay the company uh, at a later date, repay the manufacturer. So short selling is the same, short selling is the same with stocks. Uh, it, it, it enables anybody, you or me or a hedge fund to go out there and say, I think the price of you know, Tesla is too high so I am going to borrow the shares from someone else's account. The other person does not know. There's no harm to that person. As a matter of fact, in many cases, they get paid interest for you borrowing their shares. But then you sell them, or, in, or more in reality, you say, this price is what I think is too high. And then you just have to pay the person back uh, whenever you determine, right? So what it is, it's, it's another important way. I think the people who are saying it's horrible and it's bad, including Elon Musk, I think they're wrong because what, what you're enabling people to do is to say, hey, this stock over here, this Enron, that price is way too high. And if people are willing to pay $100, $100 a share for Enron, I'll sell it to you for $100 a share because I know that later I can buy it for a dollar a share. 
I can buy it back for a dollar share and I'll repay you back $1 instead of a hundred dollars. And that's how short sellers make money. So you think it's people who are putting their money where their mouth is like, yeah. I believe this is overpriced. I'm willing to, I'm willing to, you know, I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is. I'm willing to say, I will borrow this stuff. And Hey, if I'm wrong, I'm going to pay. So like Ackman with Herbalife, right? Correct. And like a lot of people with Tesla. I mean, I think Tesla is very, very, a lot of people are selling that short. So what's a short squeeze? Because this apparently is, and, and how did the Redditors figure out to do the short squeeze on some of their like favorite, you know, childhood uh, uh, names? Yeah. So uh, one last thing on shorting before we go to the short squeeze, it's important to note that the, another reason why I believe in it is because if you don't allow people to, to sell or to create pressure on an Enron, on a company that is doing accounting fraud or is doing something wrong, or maybe is selling a product that just doesn't have value, then you're basically saying that the markets can only go up, that markets will only go in one direction and that people should continue to buy shares, but nobody, and it's like, yeah, and I, I understand that eventually if Enron comes out, people would sell their worthless shares, but short sellers have an important role in this world, especially in frothy markets to expose some of the bigger frauds. In what markets? And anyone who's seen the big short understands that concept. Did you say frothy? Frothy. frothy. <laughs> so um, now to a short squeeze. A short squeeze happens when, you know, let's say there's uh, you know- an When someone making... gives me a hug, that's a short <laughs> squeeze. <laughs> Very funny. Go ahead. Uh, no, I think a, uh, you know, a short squeeze is best evidenced by, you know, a hypothetical where, you know, a whole bunch of people think that a retailer is going to go out of business. Everybody thinks that JCPenney is going to go out of business and it eventually did. So they start short selling the stock, but then JCPenney announces and it's done by way of a press release. They say, we just got financing to stay in business for the next five years from Bank of America. They just gave us a $5 billion loan and we're going to be in business for the next five years. And then everybody says, oh my gosh, crap, our shorts are not going to work. So they go and they have to replace the shares. So they have to buy them now as the share price is going up. And so that creates this crazy, crazy amount of buying. So upward pressure on the stock, it only gets worse as people have to exit the shorts. That is a short squeeze. The term is thrown around too much these days. GameStop was probably a genuine short squeeze, but there's also a healthy dose of mania in there. It was more the sheep mentality than just a short squeeze. So there was some uh, tulip. What was it the uh, just a little bit, that? just a little bit of tulip. The tulip, tulip craze. Um, tulip, yeah, yeah. So, so, so the redditors. But see, here's what I don't understand, Mike. So, I, from what I understand, and this is why I want to talk to you. From what I understand is that the redditors saw that the Wall Street hedge fund guys that probably picked on them in high school, right? That they saw that they were extremely leveraged on the short stuff. And they, rather than a press release from JCPenney, they said, let's us drive the price up, right? Sure. So let's pick that apart because I think that is going to go down in history as one of the biggest myths of this entire episode. Okay. This, this episode in life and this episode of, of political-ish. So first of all, uh, this idea that the hedge funds were all short game stuff. Well, first of all, there, as we discussed in the, in the introduction, and that's why your introduction was so important, there is no one hedge fund. It's a gigantic industry. It's almost like saying, I hate cars, so I crashed into one on my street. Okay, well, that didn't really do much to hurt Mercedes. Uh, even if you crashed one to one Chevy, it didn't do much. Secondly, it's almost like saying, I hate companies. I hate uh, clothing companies, so I'm going to you know, do something to American. I mean, there's a wide variety of companies out there. There's a wide variety of hedge funds. Secondly, there's just as many hedge funds have, you know, as part of their quantitative uh, funds, they have momentum plays. So if they see that GameStop is going from 34 to 35 to 36 to 37, their computer can recognize that trend a lot faster than you and I, and their computer will buy at 37 and sell at 38, or in this case, 380. So in many cases, these people helped, not hurt, the hedge funds. And the third component to this, uh, this myth that I think is really important to tell is, um, this idea that you know, it was the public doing this to the hedge funds. Keep in mind that the stock market to some degree depends on the greater fool, the next fool coming along. And there were a lot of people I know who bought GameStop at $350 a share. I think it hit 400 something dollars a share and because they thought it would go up to $405 a share. Well, today I think it got down to 80. It was back down to 80. It might be at about 99 at, at the time of recording this. 
so, you know, there were a lot of regular guys and regular gals who got hurt as well. And then finally, and this is more food for thought, were these really regular folks manipulating the price of games? Well, that, okay. So that's what I, that you kind of broached that a little bit ago, and that's what I wanted to uh, put on hold. But let's talk about that now, because that that is a topic of conversation now. And you see this a lot on the financial networks who are saying, look, I don't even think these were regular guys. Yeah. These were probably folks who had infiltrated because it's open it's open and like you said they have crawlers but go ahead why don't you touch on that well the papers today reported that the guy who originally uh you know started the GameStop trend or allegedly started the GameStop trend is a guy who is literally sitting in his basement and uh he's a somewhat geeky you know guy and uh they credit him as being the source of this but what they mean by that is this was a guy who was very bullish on GameStop and he went on, he went on Wall Street Bets and posted pictures of his stuff dating back to 2019. He said, oh, I really like this, uh, this company, I think. And ironically, he's a value investor. He's, a, he's not somebody who's looking for crazy gains. He's somebody who's looking for maybe a 10 or 20% gain on his investment because he sees an undervalued company. Uh, but that alone, you know, one guy posting gee, I think, you know, Ford stock or General Motors stock or some boring stock is undervalued. GameStop is not enough to move the market. So your question really turned to this essential question, which is who created this craze? Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of stock, a lot of people post their stock tips. I can give them to you. They're, they're literally not worth anything. Yours are probably not worth anything. You mean, no offense. To assume that something was moved in this day where thousands of shares are traded a second, millions are traded a day, I think there had to be a little bit more at play than a guy in his basement saying, gee, look at what the, the shares I buy. I mean, with all due respect to that guy, I don't think too many people would buy it based on that. I do think that it's totally possible that there was another party who was long GameStop, who was uh, posting stuff on those boards and having bots post on Twitter and do all the things that typically move markets in the modern world. Elon Musk, I think, is seen as someone who really provided a lot of momentum to this when he went on that board, right? And I think he posted Game Stonk with exclamation points. Um, what's your take on that? How much could it, I mean, because you know everybody, uh, especially in that world, I mean, they, he's there, right? I mean, he's, he's iconic to these kids. So sure. um, I use the word eh, to these guys. Um, what's your take on how much of an influence he had in boosting that up? And I don't think he's not the person that you were kind of referring to there, is he? No. Well, not at all. I, uh, you know, I think it will come out that, you know, I mean, look, if you believe that there are Chinese and Russian uh, bots and hackers that post stuff on Twitter, and this is, I think, more or less objectively been proven to be true, that there are hundreds of thousands of accounts that magnify and amplify discord in the United States on Twitter and other social media uh, that are based overseas or in some cases based here, uh, then I don't think it's that hard for people to make the next logical leap, which is that there are people who have a stake in the stock market who also post stuff on Reddit and Twitter and Facebook and so on and so forth. This was not just one guy. This was not just this small cadre of guys saying, stick it to the man, because there's stuff like that posted every day and it doesn't really go anywhere. This was targeted and magnified. Was it Elon Musk? Probably not. But Elon Musk's power and his fan base was best exemplified by earlier this year, he posted something like, you know, use Signal. And I think he was referring to the chat app. Not the soap. Which, yeah, which a lot of people, uh, you know, favor reporters for, for its uh, privacy. Uh, but immediately there's a company called Signal and the shares went up like 400% that day. Uh, and again, oh my God. Then on the next day, but you know, a lot of people made a lot of money by a mistaken uh, suggestion that maybe Tesla was going to use Signal to to supply auto parts or something. <laughs> That's pretty wild. I missed that one. I missed that one, Mike. So the next, the next, uh, the next part of this is then as the price began to go and go and go and got to like heights that I don't think anyone ever could have fathomed. Um, then Robinhood stops allowing you to buy on their site. And then all the swords came out because, right, because this is now, I mean, this is every man's platform. This is the base of, of the, uh, you know, Wall Street bets folks because it's the every man platform. And so now they're saying you can't buy anymore. So these guys are now stuck, right? 
And um, so what what happens? Like, why did Robin Hood do that? Because honestly, I was really upset with that. I'm like, what? They're rigging this for the big guys. They're allowing the big guys to continue doing what they're doing while the poor little guys, now they're stuck. So was that right? And if so, why? Why did they do that? So I'm going to take a crazy position, which I think is uh, different from some of the populism, the rah-rah populism out there. And I'm going to say that Robin Hood was probably not act. Robin Hood and E-Trade and Ameritrade, who all did this. And by the way, I am suing, I'm an attorney in practice, and I am suing a brokerage, a series of brokerages, for what I believe were truly uh, you know, unfair things that they did during the, the, uh, the oil futures debacle of April last year. I'm the You're first friend. to call out yeah. these, these companies when they do something wrong. Here I will go on record saying that I don't think that they were doing anything necessarily for nefarious purposes. People will say, but the free market. Well, we don't have a free market. We have a market that, um, you know, there already are curbs on all kinds of things. You want to see a curb? I mean, go into an account and try to try to short a certain stocks that where too many people are shorting them. The, the brokerage will send a message to you saying, sorry, you're not allowed to borrow these shares. You're not allowed to short this stock. There are already curves on short selling. There's already curves on buying certain certain shares, and you know if if you want to look at this from the benefit of hindsight, it's very simple. If you can honestly look in the mirror and say, "I was going to go on Robinhood and I was going to buy ten shares of GameStop at two hundred dollars, and I was going to have the discipline to sell it at three hundred dollars," I know I was going to have the discipline. I wasn't going to try to ride it out. I wasn't going to try to make a million bucks. I was going to sell it later that day at 300 bucks. Okay, then Robinhood maybe hurt you. But if you were going to go on uh, on Robinhood, like millions of people were going to do, and we're going to buy GameStop at 350, and again, you know that today it's at 80 bucks, 99 bucks, you were going to lose your shirt. And yeah, there's some paternalism in there. And yeah, you know, Robinhood was maybe taking some actions, but the last thing these companies want is a whole bunch of pissed off and broke traders because. That's what happens. Uh, you know, these, these platforms do allow people to buy on margin, meaning that you are borrowing money from them uh, to trade stocks. And you could quickly have some pretty serious financial contagion when you have millions of Americans buying shares at $300 and it's down at 80 bucks a couple of days later. So, I mean, the other argument there, Mike, is that, well, no one stopped Americans for, in 2008 from buying homes, right? That were selling for twice what they were worth. Where were the, you know, the paternalistic folks then saying, hey, guys, don't buy this. These houses are one, oh, you know, 200 percent overpriced. Um, you know, and I, I, I saw those houses then in 2008. I don't know. I might even talk to you about it. I was like, dude, I can't believe like with these ho- these houses that are selling for one point five million. This is nuts. Um, I mean, right now where I live, right, that's where, what houses are selling but there's an actual reason. It's people from the Bay Area that are coming out here and driving the prices up, right? Then it was nothing but speculation. So, sure. so the question is, how can you say that, sure, there's paternalism and that's okay because we don't want all these broke, you know, uh, all these broke investors, you know, Robin Hood investors walking around, but no one did anything when people were buying homes that were only half, a, half the value of what they should have been. So au contraire, and that's where I will come in and say, you know, I hate bureaucrats, I'm not going to defend them. Uh, but the, I think the bureaucrats, you know, and to some degree the, the corporate bureaucrats, again, were making the right call here because there were, I don't know, five, 10 years of congressional hearings and prosecutions and, you know, a big hue and cry from some of the same politicians who are speaking out of the other side of their mouth here, saying, why didn't Wells Fargo stop people from buying homes? Why didn't Bank of America? And there was actually consequences. There was actually some of these mortgage lenders were basically told by regulators, by Congress that, hey, you let somebody who did not have the means to buy a house that was grossly overinflated at a time where everybody knew that there was a bubble or people should have known that there was a bubble. And you, uh, you, you know, let all these people make poor decisions and they wanted more paternalism. And now you've got these same politicians, people like AOC saying, oh, we hate this. They should just let Americans buy these shares. But, you know, I I think it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't scenario. I mean, again, you know, it's impossible to know with hindsight. If you were going to buy a house in 2006 
and you're going to buy it for a million and you were going to have the discipline to turn around and sell it the next month for a million one. Okay. If somebody had stopped you, they prevented you from making a hundred grand. Uh, same thing here. But the reality is a lot of people who are buying during those crazy times, they ended up losing everything. And I think the, the outcry was bigger than saying, why did you allow them to do this? Where was the paternalism? And now some of those same people are saying this was too paternalistic. You can't have it both ways. I think having some controls in place makes sense. Otherwise, you're going to get second guessed after, after the fact, no matter what. So you don't think there's any truth? Well, obviously, you, you don't know. But in, to you, do you think that there, it, it's legitimate that, that it's a legitimate argument, rather, that Robinhood stopped trading because the folks at Citadel or Melvin, right, two hedge funds that are both involved, or at least one of them is involved in their upcoming IPO, right? And so the hedge fund that's involved in their upcoming IPO says, hey, you know, if you guys want to take this thing public, you need to cut this shit out. Um, you need to tamp down on this because we're losing our shorts over here. Now, of course, the idea that they're losing their shorts, I think, is overstated because these guys are beyond huge. So anyway, I'm just repeating the argument. <laughs> Do you? Sure. And then therefore, they follow the lead of, of the guys that are going to be taking them into the IPO. Do you think that, that anything there is legitimate or valid? Well, let's go macro, and then we'll go right back down to the micro. So, so ma my statement that I just said, I think applies to the industry. Um, Charles Schwab, Fidelity, you know, all of these firms were putting curbs on people buying GameStop. And the idea that there was some vast conspiracy with these other firms that have no interest in shorting GameStop, that's a bit far-fetched. What they were trying to do is avoid getting hauled before Congress saying, why did you let people buy that dump for a million five? You know, why did you let people buy this, this perhaps failing company for $400 a share? That's what they're trying to avoid. And I understand that and I sympathize with the situation that they're in. Now, down to the micro level, if it comes out though that one firm, let's say Robinhood, did say we wanna halt the price activity going upward so that you guys have a chance to make money on your, your options, your put options, which are akin to short sales, uh, then okay, then that is something different. That's more of a conspiracy. And I think there will be consequences if that does prove to be the case. But the one thing, again, that I will, you know, that I will note is keep in mind that these big hedge funds, they have positions on both sides. They make money if it goes up or down. Secondly, uh, you know, these, um, these curbs that Robinhood put in place were also curbs on short selling. I know a lot of people, I was talking on the phone with a buddy of mine in Florida and he's like, I'm trying to short sell GameStop because I know it's gonna go down. And he was right, but he could not find any firm, any brokers that would allow him to short sell it. So it applied for people trying to buy it and people oh. trying to sell it okay. or short sell it. I don't think they're gonna find much there there. That's interesting because I actually hadn't heard that. I hadn't put that there were, there were breaks on the short selling, um, well, maybe publicly. Um, so, so, okay. Well, that's interesting, man. That, that's, uh, that's an interesting take. So I was reading something and the guy from Barstool Sports, uh, David Portnoy, um, was saying that, uh, Robin Hood was the biggest fraud of this entire deal because of them putting a halt on the sale on the selling. And, but you're saying that it was done for, you know, for liquidity reasons, right. For SEC, uh, you know, uh, that they had to, right. They, they had to maintain a certain amount of liquidity and, they did what they had to do. So you don't, you don't I'm see saying, anything. I'm saying that the, the more likely scenario here is that they were trying to prevent a situation like 2008, where people said, you did not warn the public of a risk. You knew these houses were not worth that much. You knew the stock wasn't worth that much. You should have warned the public or at least prevented them from doing something that mm -hmm. turned out to be stupid. In reality, at least as of the time of recording this, they were correct. But they're if not you saying that. There, pardon me? But they're not saying that. They're not well, saying that publicly. The, the Schwabs and the Ameritrades and the E-Trades and the Fidelities, the big sort of established brokerages are saying that. They're saying, you know, okay. uh, when I log into my account, there's a little message that says, you know, due to our concerns about uh, weird market manipulations and weird market acts, we are limiting a variety of different positions. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, again, with GameStop, as of the time we're recording this, they proved to be absolutely correct. Uh, the people who were prevented from buying it at $483 a share, and it's now at $83 a share, they should be a little bit thankful. Okay. Okay. So the, this whole, let, let's just call it for lack of a better term, this uh, crowd trading, this mob trading, this Reddit driven information, if it is, but I, I think I believe you, I think a lot of this, cause it's all open. Right. And if you're a hedge fund, you probably got eight guys on that board all day long, right. Reading this stuff. Um, or, or your bots are on it. Right. 
and, and creating algorithms out of it. Do you think this is going to affect Wall Street and trading, the trading industry as we know it moving forward? Do you think that these guys, this whole new chapter that we saw opened up in the last week, do you think this is going to become something that affects the way business is done now? Or do you think it's a blip and business goes on? No, it, you know, I, I think I can answer that conclusively. And the answer is it, it has affected the way Wall Street does stuff. Um, and that even predates GameStop. You know, look, some of the, the, the hedge fund guys out there, you know, um, I don't know if how many of how many members of the audience watch Billions, but there's a character in Billions who is, um, you know, sort of hard driven, you know, rough around the edges, uh, loosely based allegedly on Stephen Cohen and another, uh, another uh, hedge fund uh, guy. You know, this this character, you know, um, represents the old school, you know, the guy who actually does the research, looks at the Walmart parking lots in China to determine if sales are up, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, battling with the Quans and so on and so forth. But, but what I was going to say is, um, you know, there were comments by folks like that where they said, you know, this movement is largely being driven by guys spending their stimulus checks in their basement. Right. That actually has been proven to be more or less objectively true, even though he said it in a very inartful and demeaning way. Uh, just about a year ago, be, be, pre, before COVID, you know, like the retail investor had no ability to move a market. There just weren't enough retail investors. The big hedge funds had the ability to move a market. And that's why there's a website called Whale Wisdom, where you just look and it's like, oh, uh, this hedge fund bought 300 million shares of this company, right? And you can kind of tell that that's going to move the market. But there just weren't enough retail investors to move the market that way. That has changed. Uh, the objective statistics show that when COVID started, you did have a bunch of people. For a while, there were no sports. For six months, there were no sports. There, the people who would otherwise bet on sports were betting on the stock market. Uh, also, this reference to uh, stimulus checks. Believe it or not, the American consumer has more money in the bank now than like ever before. Uh, it's hard to believe, but the savings rate in the United States is through the roof. People have a ton of liquidity. They have a ton of money. And there's a lot of people who are dabbling in the stock market. Uh, there's an old there's an old saw from the uh, from the Great Depression where Joseph Kennedy, JFK's father, who was a notoriously brilliant stock investor and also probably one that that uh, you know did some gray stuff, that he went out uh, you know to get a shoe shine one day and the shoe shine boy said, oh hey I've got some stock tips for you, and he knew that if the market had gone where it started with, you know, the big banks buying shares and then the hedge funds of the day and then the wealthy people and then the middle class and then the, the, the lower classes. And now it was down to the shoeshine guy buying stocks that there were no potential buyers left. <laughs> and he went out there and he shorted the whole market. He sold everything he had. This was in October, 1929. The crash happened a few days later. Um, you know, people might question whether we are getting towards that place where, you know, I mean, I got a call from my 23 year old cousin who uh, has never bought a stock in her life. And she's like, I'm buying GameStop. And it was like, oh boy, oh okay. God. Let me tell you, let me tell you, okay, <laughs> this is what you should expect. Just go in eyes wide open. She's brilliant. I mean, I, I think she, she understands things in many ways better than I do, but we should be aware that we are at a level where there's a lot of retail activity in the market and it is moving the market. Yeah. And I think you, if you look at um, the top, the top selling apps this week, they're all these Robinhood, not Robinhood, I mean, Robinhood, I think is number one, but they're all these, these trading apps. So I think you're right. I think we're getting a little bit of fever here uh, going on. So, so as we move forward, class action lawsuit, do you think that has any legitimacy? Do you think? There's yeah, I mean, but Rob, Robin, I mean, you know, the, the, I always tell my clients there is that there's a legal answer and there's a practical answer. The legal answer is, who knows? I don't know if they'll have uh, too much there unless they can find that smoking gun I reference where they were collaborating with the hedge funds to do something manipulative. Uh, but practically, Robinhood wants to go public in the next year or two years. And when you go public, you never want to have a big pending lawsuit. So my prediction is that lawsuit will settle. Hmm. Okay, good. That's pretty smart. And then now uh, policy regulatory as we move forward, is there anything that, I guess two parts of this question, could be done or should be done? Um, I think I know where you're going to come from. There shouldn't be done anything. This would just play out in the real world. This is what it is, right? Let the market be the market. Well, I, market will always be italicized in my head. Let the market be the market. Um, but what's your take? Is there anything that should be done or, or could be done? Yeah, great question. And I wish there was an easy answer. I mean, the reality is it's a very complex answer. 
what will be done. I mean, look, law, lawmakers have already started grandstand. There will be hearings on Capitol Hill. You'll have people saying, oh my gosh, you were you know, hurting the small guy. But as we, as we went into, I think for very sound reasons, that's all nonsense. And that's gonna be just that grandstanding. In terms of what could be done, oh my gosh, there should be a gazillion things done to the market to make it in many ways more free and in many ways, in other ways, more regulated. I mean, we have a system right now where, you know, you know, I mean, high frequency trading, right? I mean, this idea that as, as we started the show, you know, the idea that you should be able to make billions of dollars a year by making a trillion trades a day. Uh, there have been proposals to put uh, proposals to put like a one one hundredths of a cent tax on every trade, you know, which, which would produce like a trillion dollars in revenue a year, you know, to maybe make the markets a little more fair. And there have certainly been books written on the impact of high frequency trades on the market. Do I think that should be done? Who knows? I mean, you know, again, I do think they do help the average retail investor get a good price for market executions. But at the same time, I also question whether we want to have a world where when everybody goes back to work and they can't trade at work, and when everybody, you know, there's no more stimulus and people are betting on the World Series again and so on and so forth, will we, do we really want to live in a world where 90% of the trades every day are done by computers? Probably not. So, I mean, we have to strike a balance. And, uh, but do I have faith that Congress is going to do that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> Come on, man. I think we both know better than that. Um, you know, I just, you know, I think my, I believe this is just a moment and we'll move past this moment. It will be like the other hundreds of moments we've had in the past two years. It's just a moment. Um, we're in a world now where we always look for shit and this happens to be the shit of the moment. Um, and we'll move past it and then we'll have something else to get you on here to be the smartest guy in the world explaining to us all. But, um, um, any any last thoughts on this before we go? Any Anything? I think you've pretty much explained it. But, you know, Mike, um, we talk about casinos, right? And, you know, I represent casinos and people always look at the buildings and they're like, wow, those are beautiful buildings. They have such great food. They have this and that. And it's like, yeah, man, because a casino wins, right? You're not going to win at the end of the day. But as I think about Wall Street and I think about the immense technologic capacity, technological technical capacity that they own and possess, right? Um, probably bigger than the United States space system, if we still have one, um, right? I mean, they are just at the cutting edge of everything because every fraction of a second can mean hundreds and billi of billions of dollars. They're really, it is what it is. And retail, retail traders will never stand a chance. The, 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 the casinos are nothing compared to wall street they just aren't it's not even yeah. fair at least in the casino you have a chance to win occasionally right but but you're never going to win against the suits on wall street yeah it's, it's funny because again we, we look at empirical data there's actual data that shows that you know 30 years ago people with high iqs were by and large going to law school and medical school now they're going to business school and they're they're working on wall street there have been a diminishing in those other professions and a lot of people are going into finance uh, I have met some brilliant, scary smart and scary detailed people, uh, you know, who work uh, in, in Wall Street. And it really is awe-inspiring to see the level of diligence they do before they make an investment. But, you know, there's, there's a really, I don't know if you can see the book behind me, I don't even know if it's visible, but there's an interesting book by Nassim Taleb. It's, you know, it's the Black Swan. It's sort of re achieved cult status. And what he talks about is the, the value of luck, right? We talked about it a little bit. Uh, for everybody on Wall Street Bets who recommended a stock in I don't know, you know, some, some aging clothing retailer, uh, there's, there's 99 out of 100 times, if people bought that, they would have lost money. But there's a lucky cadre of people who bought in this GameStop trend and it took off. Um, I also, you know, I talked with a buddy and he was like, a few years ago, he was like, I'm buying Dunkin' Donuts stock. Why, why, why? People seem to really love it. Okay, well, you know, and maybe it went up and he made it from luck. The guys on Wall Street will do years of investments. You know, <laughs> right. they'll buy the satellite data for the parking lots, right? I mean, uh, to turn, <laughs> and they might both win. So, you know, that's the nature of markets. They, there is, to some degree, randomness. A lot of it is luck, and uh, you know, I mean, and the most important thing, right, is there is no alternative, right? If you want to put your money somewhere right now, the way that our our national monetary and fiscal policy is, you're going to get 0.01 percent in a savings account. Everybody almost has to be in the market because there is no alternative. There isn't. All right, Mike, Mike Gatto, again, um, 
great guest. Thank you so much for taking your time to now that the dust has settled a bit and we can look back, you know, with a little intelligence. Thank you for helping unpack this and explain it and, and give us some things to look forward to in the future. Again, thanks, Mike, for being on the show. Always and, great to be uh, here. Good luck out there in your uh, ocean, ocean view mansion. All right, man. Don't be blowing me up. I ain't getting no. If it ain't about the money, ain't no use to you ringing my line. Stop wasting my time. If it ain't about the money, nah, I can even hear what you say. I ain't finna do shit. If it ain't about the money, bitch, you can miss me with it. Bitch, miss me with it. Turn.